Welcome to the Seven Investing Podcast. I'm Dan Klein, and I'm being joined today by my fellow lead advisor, Steve Symington. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dan. This is good to have you. I am excited to do this. I've been wanting to talk about this. I've been in that sort of in-between period where, you know, we've taped a few things. We're prepping our live show. By the time this airs, we'll have had some live shows. But when we tape this, it's probably important to note we are taping this on October 6th. It's not going to air until I think October 15th. So there might be some minor developments in this story. But here's what we're talking about today. On this episode, we're going to talk about something fairly bleak. That is the state of the live entertainment business in the U.S. Steve, it's not good. We'll talk about movies, concerts, and sporting events. But before we start, Steve, what were your family's consumption habits when it came to movies and live entertainment in that magical near-forgotten time we call before the pandemic oh those were the days <laughs> weren't they yes they uh, were I, I missed them uh i would say our family was more typical in terms of movies and live entertainment consumption uh really before the pandemic we'd see maybe a couple movies in theaters every few months usually they were big blockbusters or kids centric movies that uh you know our kids love we've got three kiddos uh and the the nearby amc dine-in uh was really kind of a treat for us so we'd go you know you spend 150 bucks on everything and and you know i'd get to actually have a beer with my kids watching you know, a movie probably you know abominable or something on the the, the big screen and and uh, maybe a concert or two per year you know outside of the movies uh, between my wife and i and our oldest daughter who's almost a teenager now god help us and we we also live uh in a college town so uh football was a big deal we've got a stadium that holds half the population of our city which i guess isn't saying much but um you know there's almost thirty thousand people there so really college football games were a, a big deal and uh now obviously not so much but really nothing too extraordinary for our family in terms of out of home media consumption so let me clarify steve is having his beer uh, uh, the kids are having something else he's not having a beer with the kids he's having a beer in the presence of the kids so mm. My son and I, and to a lesser extent my wife, are pretty big movie consumers. When I moved to West Palm Beach, Florida, I wanted to live downtown, and it wasn't make or break, but I wanted to live walking distance to a movie theater, and I do. I live walking distance to an AMC, and it's not an AMC dine-in, but it is an AMC that has a bar. The bar is usually mm. only open on, on Friday and Saturday nights, but yeah, I could go get a, a beer, a glass of wine, or a mixed drink while I'm watching, and my son's old enough now that we, we like the same movie, so that's okay, but when we moved here four years ago and I might be seeing you know some animated film that I don't want to see or some like you know kid oriented film you could get through it with some junior mints and a beer that was a positive I'm a pretty big concert guy a little bit less so because I live in South Florida and the type of music I like doesn't generally come to West Palm Beach but I was always a big attendee West Palm Beach has an event called Sunfest which attracts a hundred thousand people and it's just a hodgepodge of bands like a pretty cool festival I, I flew to Seattle a few years ago to see my favorite band I I think it's fair to say I am a heavy consumer of live music, live events in general. I like doing stuff. And right now we cannot do stuff. And Steve, there's more bad news. So if we wanted to go to the movies the past couple of weeks, you could have gone. Most theaters are open. They have limited capacity. If you've seen Christopher Nolan's Tenet, you could go see it in the theater. If you, have, you could go see Empire Strikes Back. I surprised you by telling you that. Oh. Um, but okay. that's not working for the movie business. We learned this week that the Regal chain of movie theaters, that's the second largest one in the U.S., they gave up. They decided we're just going to shut our theaters down. And let's talk a little bit about why there. Box office last week for the top 10 films was about $8 million. $8 million is usually good enough for like sixth on the top 10 any given week. <laughs> So that varies a lot by week to week, but this is a bleak number, and that's not covering your electricity. That's not covering your employees. So this isn't good news because every major release has been pushed back to 2021. Steve, is this the end of movie theaters as we know them? I don't think so. Um, I don't think they go away entirely. I think, you know, in in my view, it's, it's this fantastic experience, and there will always be um, really a place for them in the entertainment landscape. Um, but it's it's going to be different. Uh, I think content creators are, are really quickly learning that they don't necessarily need them to survive and thrive. Uh, so, you know, we, we've seen um, that happen with some of the, the direct-to-video deals. Uh, you know, you, uh, Comcast and AMC, you know, they made that deal to shorten the theatrical window. 
uh, to sh- as short as 70 days and it's usually 90, right? So before films can move to video on demand. Yeah, and, that, that, uh, so that, let, let yeah. me clarify on that one. So this is a bone of contention. Previously, mm-hmm. when a movie came out, it had to stay in the theaters for roughly 90 days. There's a little variance to it. And then after that 90 days, it could go to Blu-ray. It would have a second window in cable. It would eventually end up on a streaming service, whoever they were partnered with. The AMC Comcast deal allows them to take a movie and have it be in theaters as short as as 17 days. That is three weekends. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean when the next Jurassic Park comes out, it's only going to be in theaters for 17 days? Probably not. It means when like a family movie, like, like the next school, comes out that's the scooby-doo movie that was released directly to to, i'm telling steve as if he hasn't had to see it with with three kids at home (laughs) but it's one of those things where if it's a big blockbuster film and it's bringing in tickets they're gonna keep it in the theaters they're not gonna put it in a home release but if it's something that yeah maybe during school vacation it's gonna be a big driver but then it falls off a lot they're gonna be able to move it quickly and it's an interesting deal because in theory amc gets a cut of the money i think the reality is that's gonna be an irrelevant cut of the money and it's kind yeah. of amc giving up its business so i'm bleaker about theaters than you are i sure. I, I i look at it and i say and I worry about it as a, as a moviegoer, because if a movie yeah. comes out in the theaters, box office tells us something. Like it doesn't tell us if the Avengers is good, but it does a little bit because yeah. sure, a lot of us are gonna go see it on day one, but if the early adopters don't like it, it's not gonna do as well. The recent Star Wars movie is a good example of that. It came out in theaters, people didn't like it that much. It was certainly a hit, but it didn't do as well mm-hmm. as expected. That tells you something. When a movie comes out straight to Netflix, what's my, what's my cost? If I'm going to watch Bird Box, the one where Sandra Bullock wears a blindfold I, I'm, and something eats her, I'm not entirely sure what happens <laughs> in that movie. All I'm, my only cost is two hours. And I think that lowers the quality of movies. So I do think there's a need for theaters, but how do you survive when there's not going to be any business for the next six months? I mean, what, if I owned a movie theater, Steve, what should I be doing? Uh, I, I think you, well, you, you can maybe do what AMC did a little bit. And uh, they sort of said, hey, you're ruining our symbiotic relationship. And, and for background, the, the reason they struck that deal to shorten the theatrical window came from Trolls World Tour, which uh, it, it was a huge hit for uh, Comcast and Universal when they released it on the streaming format because of the whole pandemic destroying, you know, the, the movie format. And they said, well, let's release a direct to video. And I think within the first few weeks, it had pulled in something like a hundred million in direct to video sales for them. It was ridiculously lucrative and really without the profit sharing to AMC. So the management for universal made some comments and said, well, you know, when theaters reopen, we're going to, release these movies on both theatrical and on-demand formats going forward. And then AMC threw a bit of a temper tantrum and said, wait a second. And they banned universal movies from their screens until they struck that deal and said, okay. And then they sort of walked universal, walked it back a little bit, but you know, in the backs of their minds, maybe the forefront of their minds, they say, maybe we don't need them as much as we thought they did. So uh, that could be bad, but and it yeah, would be a little sad, but. And I think that's going to come back to bite them because trolls yeah. world tour I think is actually going to prove to be an anomaly. So Mm. that was a movie that, you know, the first one wasn't that big a hit. It was more famous for the Justin Timberlake song than it was for the actual movie. But that said, when that movie came out, we'd all been stuck in our homes for, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks. It was like the height of the lockdown. (laughs) We all kind of run out of things to do and watch. And that movie came out. And I'm telling you, the youngest person in my house is 16. And we seriously debated watching Trolls World Tour. And we didn't (laughs) because my, I said to my son, we could watch Trolls World Tour if you sit down and watch Trolls. And he wouldn't do it. So I'm like, if you're not going to watch the free one, I'm not going to watch i'm not going to have you watch the paid one but i do think that movie was the right thing at the right time Mm -hmm. now if the next fast and the furious came out direct to your house would people pay for it they would but i don't think it would do a billion dollars in box office now we don't know where the delta is where if it did 600 million but they don't have to share with the theaters Mm -hmm. i actually think the model doesn't work as well as you think that it's going to be decent for like a well-known property that mm-hmm. might play in some theaters, but also have some, some streaming video. There might be some premium pricing. I don't think anyone knows how this is going to work. But I would say, when I watch something that's part of my streaming service, unless it's somehow, you know, something like The Irishman, which like yeah. was made like a theatrical movie and happened to sell to Netflix, 
that's the only time I feel like this is a movie. When I'm watching something on, on Netflix that's a movie, it's always <laughs> like that Will Smith one with the orcs and the, the yeah. swords and everybody. Like, there's no stakes, whatever. Like, it kills two hours of my time. It wasn't that good, but what do I care? I didn't shell out $25 for two tickets yeah. to see it. I didn't buy $6 popcorn and a four fifty bottle of water. Um, yeah. And there's some pluses to that. But, you know, like, people love the Adam Sandler movies on Netflix. Not a single mm-hmm. person. Well, maybe not a single person. Maybe like his mom and a couple of his friends. Yeah. But nobody's paying to see those movies if they were in theaters. Like, even if you're a fan of his, you're like, yeah, that's not that great. So yeah. I do think we're sort of struggling with what a movie is, what a movie looks like. And let's talk about movie theaters. So you mentioned the dining. And we have one near us uh, in, in our second house, at our Orlando house, that's like a cinema grill. And it's a real, like, restaurant experience. There's all app-based ways you can order drinks and food, which to me seems a little annoying. Like, I'm not sure I need waiters walking around while I'm watching a movie, but they they do it pretty well. And I see that working. I also see like theaters, maybe they could be used for corporate meetings when you're having more companies be spread out. Now that's Mm -hmm. not relevant where you live, but I live in Southern Florida. There's probably a decent combination of tech people that are living here and other companies. And maybe they rent a theater in Miami to bring people in for their corporate meeting because more people are working remote. There's obviously some ability to show sporting events. Uh, you know, they televise Red Sox games here at the local AMC because there's a big mm-hmm. population of ex-Boston people in Florida. Same thing with Yankees games, UFC fights. But to do that, you need to have drinks. You need to have decent food. You need yeah. to really pivot. The biggest thing the movie industry has going for it, and I make this joke about, about cruise lines all the time, in a bankruptcy, the, the, the debt holders aren't like, hey, Carnival Cruise Lines, yeah, we'll take one of your ships. Like, we'll take that back. What are they going to do with it? Like, there's no value to it. If you're the landlord for a movie theater, which is usually Simon Property Group or, or Brookfield, that's a lot of them. If you're the landlord, you don't want the movie theater to close. You're going to work with them because what are you going to do with it? You're going to have to knock it down. And it's a really big space. So I think you're probably going to see some bankruptcies in this space. Yep. Um, and I think you're probably going to see some reorganizations. And it wouldn't shock me if you saw the movie studios take an interest or maybe even a Hulu style consortium where they control them. Because that used to be illegal. A judge had said that's no longer illegal. Because I do think if you're the big companies that make movies, yeah. you are sitting there and you want theaters to survive. Am I missing something there, Steve? No, uh, I, I think you're kind of on base. There needs to be I think for them to survive, there needs to be maybe a way to to branch out that way in terms of how they collect revenue, but also it, they're going to really need to differentiate themselves in, in terms of the experience. Like that AMC dining model helps. I mean, that's, to be honest, like don't even go. We don't go to any other theater anymore because it's like, why would you? <laughs> the The ticket cost isn't that much different. And it's like, well, we could go, you know, two birds, one stone. And they do it really well, you know, and, and they're not kind of up in your, your grill while you're watching the movie. You're not trying to look around them. There's a ton of space and the kids are happy because they're eating and, you know, and, uh, you know, unless we had one time when they didn't bring our food at all and then brought us a bill. So that was fun. <laughs> but it's, you get to the end of the movie and here comes your tab. And like, I'm like, no, <laughs> we literally got nothing. Kids are bawling and we go to Red Robin afterward. And I'm like, oh, this stunk. But, uh, you know, you'll have flubs like that. But uh, I think in order to survive, you, they're going to really need to get people to have a reason to come out and, and enjoy that experience. So um, I, I agree with that fully. So let's talk a little bit about the investment angle. We'll close up with mm-hmm. concerts in a little bit. But the investment angle here i think it's really important people ask us all the time wow this business is really beaten down amc stocks like four dollars it has Mm -hmm. to make a comeback right the answer is absolutely no like i would not touch (laughs) any of these stocks steve Mm -hmm. i mean steve make an art can you make any argument for investing these weren't great businesses before this i can't imagine during a pandemic taking on debt with an uncertainty about the product availability to to be viable I yeah. wouldn't touch this in a million years. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a possibility that you get some sort of, of Hertz-esque like rebound when it's skirting on bankruptcy, but that's so risky and so just, but it's not a, it's not the way to invest. And I mean, yeah, and you saw, you, I think AMC shares fell ten uh, percent yesterday when Regal announced that they were closing all those screens uh, because people are like, well, who's next? <laughs> and yeah, you know, and how's I, this sustainable? And I want to stress the investing lesson of mm-hmm. you don't buy something because it might have a pop. 
Like, yeah. and, and it might, there could be a dead cat bounce here. They're, they might avoid bankruptcy. But that being said, mm-hmm. so when, when they come out of this, let's pretend it's uh, February of next year. Movies are starting to come out. We've got, you know, James Bond, Wonder Woman, whatever it is, they're all going to come out. We, we start seeing, okay, people, there's pent up demand. We really want to go to the movies because it's safe now. We, we miss uh, eating dots and having to have dots in our teeth for the next right. three months. Like all that experience we're excited about. And you look and you go, okay, well, AMC is going to go back to being a slightly profitable business. Yeah. It's going to be a slightly profitable business with billions of dollars in debt. Yeah. So if you're going to invest in entertainment, I would invest in the content creators. I think yeah. the, look at the ones that control the pipeline. Now, if mm-hmm. some of those creators come in and they end up investing in theaters, that makes those a better business because yeah. then they control the full supply chain and sure. they can say, hey, this isn't doing well. Let's pull it in eight days instead of 17 days. Steve, what are your mm-hmm. thoughts on, on investing in entertainment? Besides maybe like, you know, taking me to a Springsteen concert. Yeah, well, the, the thought about them coming out of this basically as a more indebted business that's slightly profitable kind of rings uh, pretty accurate to me. That m- makes me think of the reason Warren Buffett sold his airline holdings earlier this year. And he basically said, you know, now... <laughs> We're going to have airlines that, well, at that time, it was like they're going to borrow $14 billion to stay afloat. And as an investor, that's a $14 billion net negative that's going to come out of earnings eventually when they have to repay it. So I am $14 billion worse off. And who knows how it's going to be for, for theaters specifically. Um, but that's, that's a really tough position to be put in as an investor who doesn't count on near-term swings and... Uh, momentum and that kind of stuff. Like I'm looking for solid businesses that have room to grow over the long term into significant total addressable markets. And for me, theaters don't match uh, that bill. It just doesn't line up for me. So that's that's really tough. Uh, I mean, you could end up having you know something that's that's distressed in a situation like you know Amazon's buying old Sears locations for you know, warehousing and, and maybe some of their own physical stores and stuff like that. But at that term or at that point, it it's, you're grasping at straws to try and stay, stay where you are. So I can't yeah. see and, that. And, and look, I'm not in favor of making a play for the recovery of theaters. Mm-hmm. But if I was going to make that bet, I'd actually yeah. buy Simon property group. Like right. I, I, yeah. I think they could come in and, and end up owning some theaters, maybe, yeah you know, taking some of them and transforming them into, you know, some of the space into a restaurant, some of the Mm -hmm. space into a comedy club. Like, I don't think we need as many screens as we have, but there's one more area where I think movie theaters are going to be useful and that's live concerts. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big live concert guy. Um, But last year, the, uh, the Rolling Stones were touring. My, my brother was actually pretty instrumental in, in bringing a date to, uh, to the Washington football team's stadium. He used to, to work for them as a chief business officer. And there were 12 dates on that tour. And that's an AEG tour where he used to work. And he called up and he said, ah, now there's 13 dates on the, st- on the tour. Hmm. That's not exactly what happened, but I was very excited. I was going to get to go see the Rolling Stones in a suite. And that concert never happened. My brother stopped working there. Lots of reasons. But it always seemed odd to me that they'd only be doing 13 shows, why wouldn't they, in markets they're not going to, sell tickets at a movie theater for all 13 of those shows? Yeah. Steve, th- that just makes sense, right? Yeah, it would seem to. Uh, you know, it might take a, a little bit of reorganization to have, you know, sort of a stage that you can play with. And, you know, it's funny, it sort of went in reverse. Uh, in the town I grew up, Kalispell, Montana, they had a couple, uh, the Liberty and the Strand Theater. And they both had stages because that's what they started as was plays. And uh, you know, I remember my mom used to, she had a part-time job cleaning theaters when we were really little. And my sister and I used to stand up and be like, ladies and gentlemen, you know, up on the, <laughs> up on the stage because it was so fun. And they, you know, it was, it was neat. Um, but that's a, that'd be an interesting little value add. Uh, it wouldn't convince me to buy movie theaters, <laughs> you know, their stocks, but uh, it could be, you know, potentially a way to, to maximize it. But uh, yeah, I, mean, I think movie theaters could be used like that for small live venues. A lot of yeah. markets have mm-hmm. a shortage of in between the club and yeah. the theater and yeah. a movie theater, especially if you do things like the ability to like change the size of it, where there's walls that could come down and sure. you know, it's a 300 seat. But, but I think for the big concerts, if you had, okay, it's the Rolling Stones. Well, we sold mm-hmm. out 300 tickets. Okay. Put it on another screen. Now it's, yeah. I think there's a lot of optionality there. I also think some of the smaller bands that I like, like yeah. my favorite bands aren't full-time bands anymore. And yeah. when they put out an album, they do like six to 
to 10 dates. So I think there's a lot of options to say, okay, we're playing our home show in yeah. Boston. Let's make that available at movie theaters and at home for 10 bucks. Like I yeah. do think that will work. None of the concert models I've seen, and tell me if I'm wrong, Steve, but like Garth Brooks can do 500 cars in a parking lot and charge $300 yeah. a car. There's yeah. not a lot of people who can make that model work viably. No, and I guess the, the question for me becomes whether it works at scale on a, um, on, on a scale that is meaningful to their top and bottom lines. So, you know, does that actually happen? And, you know, you've got, um, you've got companies out there that work on, uh, on actually securing these sorts of live events, but uh, I'm not entirely convinced that venues uh, are a big issue uh, for those, a lot of those live events, you know, it could be something where the capital required to support a program like that uh, may not be worth it for them. So it's hard for me, but there is a reason, you know, we've got a, an old historical theater here in town called the Wilma and uh, it holds concerts and shows movies. And uh, there's a reason it does that is because it, you know, it sort of makes the, the whole system viable for them. But can they do that with a company like, uh, you know, AMC or Regal, where you have thousands and thousands of screens that you're trying to just kind of put up for rent is like, I don't know, you know, so. I think you've seen some of it with like one off operas and things like yeah. that, you know, and, and I think you'll see more of that. I think the concert business essentially yeah. is going to be a tiny niche. Let's mm -hmm. do it for fun business until yeah. the pandemic is cured. I don't think there's any yeah. way to run like, look, you can't run an arena show with 25% capacity because just yeah. the union cost of doing that in most yeah. markets makes it not viable. That being said, when the concert business comes back, like let's say it is February of yeah. next year where it's totally safe to sell out Madison Square Garden, mm -hmm. the artists are going to have to be more flexible. I, I talked to someone inside the industry and he said previously, if let's say like a pop star, like an Ariana Grande said, well, I want $2 million guaranteed for this deal and some upside. They could mm -hmm. make that deal because they knew how the tickets were going to sell. They knew how everything was going to work. At yeah. least in the first couple years of this post-pandemic world, yeah. unless you're the biggest artists on the planet, you're going to need to deal with flexible deals where you're not getting a giant guarantee, where you're getting a cut of it. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more innovation in terms of you know how tickets are sold. Uh, yeah. you know, we've seen this in sports with the secondary markets where I, I, I'm a big New York Rangers fan. My college roommate has season tickets. Mm -hmm. You can sell those season tickets but it's through their ticket partner. It's not on yeah. StubHub. And that makes it, which their ticket partner might be StubHub, but it makes it yeah. easier to transfer those. I don't know, Steve, when's the next time you see yourself going to a concert? I, I hope soon enough. It, it, it kills me because I, I'm thirsty for that kind of live entertainment. I miss concerts and, you know, I've had memories pop up on Facebook that make me kind of sigh and go, ah, oh, I remember that. That was so much fun. And uh, we, you know, we had one, two, two concerts actually that were delayed because of the pandemic. And one of them was canceled altogether. And the other one was pushed back until TBD next year. And uh, so I, I can't wait. You know, I don't think they'll, they'll, uh, they'll go away. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I, that's hard I, for me. I agree. I, I also think it's another area that's just not investable. Yeah. Like the, the, these live event companies and, and the ticket companies, it's going to be a long time without business. That's going to pile yeah. up debt. That's, you know, look, even some of the, the people they're laying off when the businesses yeah. get good, they're going to have to replace them. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not encouraged. And, and, and I agree, like, I'm happy to get back. I, I had... Yeah tickets like i missed it by just a couple of days like something i of course i probably would have got infected had had it happened but yeah. i was supposed to see uh dashboard confessional in a fairly historic venue in washington dc and I, mm -hmm. it wasn't so much that i was excited about the band is that i'd never been to this venue that like all my favorite like alternative bands had played in i'm looking forward to getting back there but hey some of these venues have gone away yeah. some of it has changed folks seven investors i would say the future of entertainment is to be determined. We yeah. know streaming is doing well. We know sort of what's going to succeed. We don't know what the movie theater business is going to look like. My final thought, and I'll give Steve a last word here, is there will be movie theaters. I mm -hmm. don't think there will be as many. I think many movies that would have been released two years ago will not be released to theaters. I don't think you're going to see like a lot of art house films. I think there's going to be different ways to experience that. And that's probably yeah. going to be through streaming services. But if you're telling me like it's a movie with like the rock battling a dragon, we're going to go see that in the theaters. You know, there's probably like eight rock movies piled up just waiting and they're all like pretty similar. Like one's an earthquake, one's a, like a, a firestorm. 
but we'll go see those in a theater because they have spectacle. I'm not sure we're going to go see the small stuff. Steve, your, your final thoughts here. Um, I'm, I'm passively, when it comes to, you know, possible investable opportunities, when it comes to like the comeback of live entertainment, I think maybe one company might sort of, you know, if we're not talking, if we exclude all streaming options, you know, digital ads, like the, I mean, there's so many good opportunities there. Uh, but if we're talking about something, some, some company that purely is like a pure play on live entertainment, I would maybe passively watch live nation. Um, you know, LYVs, that ticker. So, I mean, there's a reason they haven't recovered from their February highs, uh, but they were rolling pretty well uh, leading up to that. So it was kind of an intriguing business in that sense. Never intriguing enough for me to personally pull the trigger and this hurt them bad. Uh, but, you know, I'll be curious to see um, how they, they rebound and that might be a good kind of barometer for the industry as a whole. If you're let, going me, there, let, so. let, let me ask one follow-up question because I have a personal philosophy on investing is I won't invest in a company that I hate doing business with. So <laughs> yes. I recognize an investor that Home Depot and Lowe's are probably both retail companies I should own. Mm -hmm. I don't because my personal experience with them is absolutely terrible. Their customer service is awful. Their delivery <laughs> is bad. There's no one in the store to help you. Yeah. Live Nation is a company that tax on fees that when you were like, oh, the ticket's $125. Mm -hmm. Why did I just pay $183? Oh, I, I want a physical yeah. ticket. That's $10 more. This yeah. is a very unpleasant company. I put it in my Comcast pile. Mm -hmm. I am not investing in this company. Yeah. I don't care how much money they make. Well, what's your philosophy there? I, I, I'm right there with you when it comes to tickets, especially when you're like, wait, what, why is this this much? This drives me crazy. But, uh, I think there's an interesting cohort of people who don't necessarily care. Um, that's part of the reason, you know, I'm not going to go in and, you know, you almost wonder if it's kind of ripe for disruption that way where somebody would come in and, and find a platform where they could kind of undercut them in that sense. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you there uh as far as as far as that goes you, there's a certain pile where you're like no i can't i can't be there but you know there's there's a uh but that doesn't mean that you know because some people have bad experiences with the company that it's not necessarily viable um but yeah that's yeah it, it really i mean there's only two players in that space you know mm -hmm. so the, yeah. you know the, there there's there's them and there's aeg which isn't public and yeah. of course there's eventbrite and there's some other like people nipping at the edges but i don't sure. see anybody it's ripe for disruption but when yeah, you yeah. when you yeah. own the venue mm -hmm. or that's you right. own the artist it's really difficult to be disrupted because it's yeah. all well and good if Pearl Jam comes out and says, and they did, you know, Hey, I'm not, we're not going to work with Ticketmaster back in the day. And then they say, okay, but we also control all the places you could play. You want to play the County <laughs> fair without us. Yeah. You want to play outside. Like you want to play the beach. Those are your options. Steve, this is an ongoing story. I'm sure it's one we're going to come back to everybody. Thank you for joining us here on the seven investing podcast.